Uh, if you don't know me, my name is David, and I am the youth director here, and I am going to be reading out of Genesis chapter 16, the birth of Ishmael. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she is your servant, so do with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. The angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Bir Lahai Roy, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So I realized that I haven't been here in the last couple of weeks. Some of you wondered where I was. <laughs> so let me tell you. A uh, couple weeks ago, I went down to Victoria Alliance, and I wanted to thank them because one of the things we discovered this year, at least I discovered, I had no idea. This church was planted by Victoria Alliance back in the early 60s. And what really got my attention was how they planted it, because people there in the early 60s sold their land on Vancouver Island to help plant a church here. Imagine what that land is worth today. But they had a view of much greater things than inheritances and capital and all that. They invested in the kingdom. And I believe, as you probably do, that saying thank you is a good idea. So I kind of doubt anyone from here had gone down in the last 60 years to thank them, so I thought I would. So that's what I did. Took a spin down to uh, Victoria Lines. They were very gracious, very kind, and uh, I hope that I encouraged them, and I hope I'm encouraging us to be generous and invest in the kingdom. Last Sunday, I just took a Sunday off. Not much of a story. All right. Uh, thank you, David, for reading Scripture and for getting through that name, whatever that was, the name of the well or whatever. You just handled that like a master, man. Awesome. Good for you. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, in the next few minutes, help us to continue our worship by listening to Your Word and hearing what amazing truths you have in there for us today. 
Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome in our hearts, welcome to change us, to encourage us, to confront us, and to shape us to be more like your Son. We ask that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are continuing on in our series, Good News Everywhere, because as you might recall, Jesus said the Old Testament is actually all about Him. And so that story that we just read, and if it was the first time you'd ever heard that story, you're going, say what? Um, We'll get to all that. Don't worry. But this story is about Jesus. We're going to find out how. But this is, this is a story about two very, very famous ladies in the Bible, uh, Sarah and Hagar. And it is a story about conflict, culture, and care. We get into the conflict right away because God promised a son to Abraham and Sarah. And it had been a long, long time. And the crib was still empty. Sarah, at this point, is in her early 70s. A little ripe. For normally having kids, right? So they're getting a little antsy. What's going on? Where's God's promise? Well, and then Sarah has this idea. Um, and, and we get into that, to have, to have children through, uh, th- through their slave. Now, I want to just emphasize... I don't think we have an idea of how much pressure there was on women back in those days to have a child. It was part of their culture. Your worth often amounted to, can you have children? And uh, by the way, I think the, the red-headed girl on the left really shows the thrill of family photos. That's why I picked this picture. <laughs> but kids back then, uh, they, they helped you out economically. You had more workers in your, in your fields. They could take care of you later on in life. And if you were part of a nation, then you were a hero. If you could produce 10, 12, 15 kids, that's all sold, soldiers for the army. So there was a lot of pressure on women. So Sarah's worth is on the line. And so she did what was common in those days, said, hubby, why don't we use one of our slaves to have children with? And this is where a lot of you are going to say, what? Because you're going, the Bible promotes polygamy. And, and you've probably heard this. You've probably heard people say this. The Bible promotes polygamy. What people don't understand is the Bible sometimes is just history. It just says what is. It's not a prescription for what should be. And anyone who says the Bible promotes polygamy hasn't read any of the accounts of polygamy in the Bible. They're all a disaster. They're terrible. Everyone's upset. There's fighting and all that sort of thing. The Bible promotes polygamy. No, not at all. It says Abraham... uh, he listened to his wife instead of God in this matter, in verse 2. And it isn't this that he, had, that he listened to his wife instead of God, it's that he listened to anyone instead of God is the problem. So Hagar becomes pregnant. Now, think about this. As far as the value of a woman, Hagar is a slave, but Sarah is free. Ah, but now Hagar is pregnant pregnant. Her worth just skyrocketed. Now the tables have turned. Now who's more worthy in the home? Who's worth more in the home? Now, well, Hagar gets arrogant, and she starts treating, it says, she treats Sarah with contempt. You know what it means to treat someone with contempt? You treat them like they're a nobody, like they're nothing. Oh, you used to be my master, but... I'm pregnant now. Who are you? That's the idea. And Abraham fails to protect really either one of them in this whole story. He's, uh, it's a real story of failure on his part. So Hagar leaves after being abused by uh, Sarah to some degree, whether it's verbal or whatever, we don't know. But Hagar looks like she's attempting to return back home to 
Egypt, and she stopped by the angel of the Lord. This is where things get really interesting. Because if you've read the Old Testament, and I hope that all of you have, but if you haven't, there is this awesome and mysterious figure called the angel of the Lord that appears on occasion. And this, this angel, and remember angel just means messenger, this messenger of the Lord appeared to Moses, Jacob, Joshua, and here to Hagar. And every person who comes in contact with the angel of the Lord walks away saying, I have seen God. Now, wait a second. What's going on here? For those who know their Bible well, you're going to call foul on that one. Contradiction right away. How can they have seen God? Because, wait a second, didn't John write in the first chapter of his book, no one has ever seen God? Check it out. He did. It's there. He says, no one has ever seen God. But wait, back in the Old Testament, they're saying, I just saw God. Contradiction. Can't trust the Bible. Go home. If you don't understand the Bible, then it looks on the surface like a contradiction. But when you understand the nature of the Trinity, it makes a whole lot more sense. No one has ever seen God the Father, true. But this is what John also wrote in the first chapter. He says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. So who is this angel of the Lord? Well, here we go. Jesus said the whole Old Testament was about him, right? And here he's making a guest appearance. This angel of the Lord, when you see the angel, not an angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, this is Jesus. Jesus is visiting a slave girl in the desert. This is cool. And this brings us to our first point. God's love does not begin with our success. Think about who Hagar is. She is one of the lowest people on the social rung. She is, or on the ladder, she is a woman, she's a slave. And yet, Jesus comes to her, visits her. She says, you are the God who sees me. How many of you in this room have wondered this week whether God sees you? I'll bet a lot of you. I'll bet maybe every single one of us. You are the God who sees me. And then we read this. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Now, one thing you might not know is in the original Hebrew, it doesn't have cry of. Those are just the translators trying to help you understand what's going on. But literally it says, for the Lord has heard your distress. The Lord has heard your distress. Do you understand what that means? Not heard your eloquent prayer of distress or got your letter of distress. God heard your distress. It's an internal thing. God hears what's inside of you. Unspoken. How cool is that? He hears your distress, your anguish, your emotion, your pain. Now, Hagar is outside of this wonderful line that, uh, of, of a lineage that eventually gets to the Messiah. She's outside of that. She's not part of necessarily the big story, not part of the most important family. She doesn't play necessarily a big role. She's just a slave, and yet God hears her unspoken groans, and responds. This should be great encouragement to every person in this room. I found it a great encouragement to me. Because it's easy, even in churches, to think of yourself as nothing. Well, God certainly hears those who are in leadership. Probably hears the pastor, the elders, connect leaders, ministry leaders, probably hears them. Oh, and those people who are serving all around here, yeah, probably hears them, but who am I? I'm nobody. 
I'm nothing. And here we have this great story of God hearing the person who's probably on the lowest rung of the ladder in society. Haven't we all felt, I'm not important, I'm nobody, I don't belong? Oh, I hear this one a lot in churches. I'm not sure I belong here. Nobody belongs here. Nobody fits in. I've said this before, we're all a bunch of weirdos. That's what a, that's what a church is. One, one theologian said, we're, we're a group of natural enemies. And I thought, that's, that's kind of true. But we often think we're not important, that we're less than. And if you think pastors don't, I just want to let you into the world of a pastor a little bit. Pastors feel the same thing. Because we start comparing ourselves to other pastors. You know, oh, well, look at how popular that pastor is. Look at how many, you know, views they get on YouTube. <laughs> they get invited to speak at conferences. They're talked about over coffee. And we play the self-pity game just like every single other person in the room. Well, the beautiful thing, God doesn't care about your success. He doesn't care about how moral you are or how hard you work or what kind of impact you have. Here we have someone who's a slave woman. And God hears her distress and responds. This is the God we worship. Not the God of the successful, not the God of the super powerful or the super spiritual or the super moral. This is a God who hears the distress, the unspoken cries of a slave. I got to tell you, I thought about this while we were singing this morning, and I just had tears well up in my eyes. I'm hoping I'm going to make it through this message. <laughs> okay. Um, God loves those in minor roles, the outsider, the small. And maybe the only reason that you came this morning was just so Jesus could tell you, I see you. I hear you. I hear your distress. Maybe that's all you need this morning. You just needed someone to say it to you so you could know that God is not the God of the super powerful and spiritual. You are the God who sees me. I hope Hagar never forgot that. And honestly, I hope you never forget it too. You are never alone. The Lord has heard your distress. Okay. Brings us to the second point. God's calling may not be attractive to you. You know, when I was first writing this message, I, I wrote it down as God's calling may not be attractive. And I thought, well, wait a second. Whatever God's calling you to, it's attractive to Him because He wants you and myself to become more like Christ. So it's attractive to Him, but it might not be attractive to us. It says, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Imagine what that must have sounded like to Hagar. Just think about that for a minute. God just, Jesus just finished telling her, I hear you, I see you. Now go back. I can't imagine what that must have sounded like in her ears. It might have even sounded like betrayal. How dare you tell me to go back. This was unwanted news. At the same time, it might have been her best option. It wasn't a great option, but it might have been her best option. Imagine a pregnant female slave wandering the desert by herself. This is not a good scenario. And then if she actually makes it back to Egypt, what kind of welcome is she going to get there? She may be rejected by everyone around her and be forced into a much, much worse situation just to survive. And who knows, maybe Sarah had cooled down by them, maybe Abraham stepped up to the plate, I don't know. 
But for whatever reason, God said, here's your assignment. Go back. And here's the point. We may not always like what God asks us to do. It may look unfair. It may look cruel, even. You know, maybe God didn't make you the smartest person or the most talented person or the most beautiful person or the strongest person or the most extroverted person. You think that's not fair. But that's God's assignment. Hebrews 11 lists a lot of people who lived a life of faith. And when you go down that list, you realize a lot of them got assignments that weren't real fun. They weren't great. And to quote what I think is one of the most quotable quotes from one of the most quotable movies, The Man in Black, he said something really profound. I hope you never forget it. I've never forgotten it. You remember what he said? He said, life is pain, Highness. Anyone who tells you differently is selling you something. Life is pain. And God gives us a choice. We're going to have pain within His assignment, with His help. We're going to have pain outside His assignment, without His help. What's your choice? God's calling may not be attractive to you. I can't imagine in that moment... Hagar thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Go back. Hagar reminds us to trust God even when we don't like what we're hearing. That's hard. That's really hard. I'm not here to tell you that's easy. That takes a lot of faith. But we are assured in Scripture that even our pain has ultimate purpose, even when we can't see it. Number three, and this is what I really want to get at. Whew. All right, God's grace frees us from our culture. Here's the main issue. The main issue is this. Every culture tells us how to work for our worth. Do you know that? Tells us what's important. If you want to be a worthy member of society, this is what you got to do. For them, for her, at that time, first of all, as a woman, be attractive. Your worth goes up if you're attractive. You're marryable then. And then, after you're done that, then you need to have a lot of babies because then your value goes up again. By the way, being attractive and having babies, neither of those you can control. Hmm. And I'm going to get into territory that I really shouldn't. <sighs> I am, as a man... <clears throat> Boy, I can't believe I'm going to do this. As a man, I'm going to try to give some observations about what it is like for a woman to find worth in Nanaimo in 2022. And if you, you can feel free to disagree with what I'm about to say in the next 60 seconds, okay? You actually, you can disagree with me at any time, but okay, in the next 60 seconds for sure. So as a woman, from what I can tell, from what I've observed... You are to have one or two children. Three is not so. <laughs> it's bad for the environment. Uh, <laughs> and, and you're kind of shamed if you have too many children. Actually, there's, kind of a, there's also a, a kind of a segment, especially among young people, to, that having children at all is, is no longer good, and it's kind of more virtuous to not have children. But we'll get beyond that. As a woman, you're also expected to have an education. To be worthy, you need to be attractive. You need to have smooth skin. You need to be thin, not too tall, not too short. You have to have curves in the right places. You got to... <laughs> you got to be tough, but not aggressive, because there's a word for that aimed specifically at women that I cannot repeat here, nor will I repeat. You have to be successful at the office, but still have time for your kids' soccer practice, piano lessons, art camp, and girl guides, plus anything else. And you need to help your kids with their science project, their lemonade stand, and their custom Halloween costume. If your child struggles academically, socially, morally, or wears the same clothes for more than one day or, or two days in a row at school, that's on you. That's our culture. That's how you shill for worth as a woman in Nanaimo in 2022. And there's probably, I'm probably only touching the mountain peaks at this point, 
there's probably far more to how you can become valuable as a woman. But did I get close? Thank you, ladies. Those of you who, those of you who say I'm not that close, you can send me an email later, okay? Okay. So you can tell in every culture there is a way. Oh, by the way, men have a different list, but we have a list. Oh, yeah. We just do. Just do. Um, so right after Jesus tells Hagar to go home, he says this. And it's one of the most beautiful things in this whole story, I think. He says, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And it's pretty easy to just kind of whip on by that and not really think about what Jesus just said there. There's two words that should stand out in what he said. Give and more. First of all, he says, I will give you. You will not earn this. You are not going to work for this. I'm just going to give this to you. And he doesn't tie it. He doesn't... He doesn't tie it to if you do all the right things, if you're a good moral person. He said, I'm going to give you. This is grace. You see what he's offering? He's offering her grace at this moment. And I will give you more. So what he's saying is, the way that you've been trying to earn your worth as a woman, as a human being, however you're trying to do that now, I'm going to give you more. I'm going, to up, I'm going to up it for you. It, it is so beautiful what he's saying here. He's saying, you've been letting your culture tell you how much you are worth. Let me tell you how much you are worth. I'm going to say that again. You tracking with me here? You see what Jesus is saying here? He says, you've been letting your culture tell you how much you are worth. Let me tell you how much you are worth. Isn't that beautiful? He says, you have a choice. You can work really hard to earn worth as a woman. Or you can receive your worth from me. I will tell you how worthy you are. If you're working to get your worth, it will enslave you. It will never satisfy. And Jesus is saying, if you let me give, I'll give you more than you imagine. Now, in, later in the New Testament, Paul writes to the Galatians and he gives a, a broad perspective of these two ladies and says, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from the slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. So these two babies become symbolic of works righteousness and grace. And the ironic thing, or the coincidental thing, I'm not sure, in this story is that God's trying to free both Sarah and Hagar from works righteousness, from trying to earn their worth. Hagar's child represents human effort, religiosity, being a good person. And here God is offering Hagar a way out of that cultural trap. Sarah's child represents grace. It's unearned. It's miraculous. It's world-changing. And yet she needs to be free from that comparison trap too. Because she's comparing herself to women who have kids. And today, you and I have the choice between following our culture or following God's grace. Who's winning? Two sociologists wrote a book called Premarital Sex in America. It was a comprehensive study following two groups of people, 18 to 23-year-old men who are unmarried. In group one, they came from families uh, who, and a community that said there's nothing wrong with premarital sex. In group B, these 
young men came from families and community that said premarital sex was wrong. In group A, 23% of them claimed to be virgins. In group B, 28% claimed to be virgins. In other words, according to, according to this study, the, it's basically a negligible, negligible difference between those two groups. And the author's conclusion says, is this, church will tell you one thing, culture will tell you another, and people will listen to their culture. Now, this, this message is not about sex. Sorry to disappoint. The takeaway is this. If we are going to follow God's grace instead of our culture, it's going to be an uphill battle. If you think you've already won, you're losing. It is hard. We are all immersed in our Canadian culture, in our island culture. We're being told certain values. We're being told, if you want to be a real man, you need to do this. If you need to be a real woman, you need to do this. If you, need to be a, if you want to be a good person, you've got to do all these things. That's our culture. It's never-ending. And we reinforce... Whatever we decide is our worth marker. However it is we're, we're trying to earn our worth in our society, we do so by comparing ourselves to other people. You see this on Facebook all the time. You hear it in coffee shop conversations all the time. I'm a great mom. See how I'm better than her? Not to pick on moms. Dads can do the same thing. I'm a strong man. Look at how weak that guy is. I'm a good person. See how much more accepting I am than those people? Comparison culture. This is how we solidify the fact I am worthy. I'm somebody. In comparison culture, our worth is found in comparing ourselves to those who are less. Just like Hagar compared herself to Sarah, and Sarah compared herself to Hagar. And on and on and on it went. Sadly, without, without God's grace, Sarah would always compare herself to women who had children. Hagar would always compare herself to women who were chosen out of love. And women who had more children and better children, a nicer husband, who homeschooled, who lost their baby weight, on and on and on it goes. We compare ourselves, do we not? That's how we get our worth. And sadly, whatever marker we decide is how we get our worth, we're always going to come across people who are thinner, smarter, curvier, more talented, better dressed, funnier, more moral. And when that happens, if we're in comparison culture, our identity gets shaken. Our worth gets shaken. And we begin to doubt whether we have any value at all. We feel unlovable, just like Hagar. What gives you worth? For believers of Christ... Anything other than the cross of Christ, what we just remembered here, His love, His sacrifice for, for us, anything other than that as a marker of our worth will enslave us. Your worthiness marker, as, as dictated by our culture, will always demand that you try harder. It will tell you you are failing. It will make you feel anxious and secure, and you'll constantly be comparing yourself to other people. You will find no rest and no peace. And that's where many of us are right now in this room. When our identity factor is not Jesus, you are following your culture's markers of worth. That's why some of us in this room are anxious, desperately trying to lose weight, wanting to climb the corporate ladder, wanting to accomplish more and be liked by perfect strangers who don't even know who we are on Facebook. It's why we fill our schedules with everything we can instead of everything we should. I 
Until our relationship with God because of the cross is our identity factor, is our worth marker, the center of our life, our joy, our reason to put feet on the ground every day, the reason that we know we are loved and valuable, a stability that grounds us, the affirmation we need, the affection we crave, we will not experience His rest. You see, the cross frees you from the worth system of the world. It frees you from your culture. It lifts you up out of that comparison game and allows you to walk out of this room every week knowing that you are absolutely loved, that, that God would love even uh, a slave girl wandering around in the desert all by herself. This is the God who is Jesus. If you're here to worship Him this morning, you chose well. You did. God says, I see you. You don't have to be successful. God says, I want to grow you. It might be difficult. You might not like His assignment at the, in the moment. And God's grace frees you to believe these words. I will give you more. I want you to let those five words sink into your heart. Because all of us will decide this week whether we are going to follow our culture or allow God's grace to determine our worth. And right now, Jesus is saying to each one of us, me included, I will give you more. Whatever you've been shilling for all this time, however you've been comparing yourself to other people, I will give you more. More and more and more. He said, I'll give you so many descendants, you won't even be able to count them. You can't even imagine the extent of God's grace, neither can I. Is your worth going to come from what our culture says your worth comes from? Or are you going to let the cross determine how, worth, how much worth you really have? The cross frees us from the game. Isn't that marvelous? Oh, man. I hope this impacts you as much as it's impacted me. Let's, let's pray. Lord, in one way or another, we have all been trying to prove to ourselves, to you, and to others that we are worthy. Some of us, it might be through our looks. Some of us, it might be through our business success. Some of us, it might be through being good parents or being beautiful or being smart. And that system has enslaved us. And we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people. And it's left us shaken and insecure and anxious. Lord, may we remember those five words, not just today, but every day. I will give you more. No matter how hard we've been trying to work, I will give you more. Lord Jesus, help us to hear you now. Some of us are so steeped into this competition culture, we can barely hear those five words. Shout them. Shout them. Please, Jesus, shout them into our hearts. I will give you more. I hear you. I see you. Shout them. May we leave here free from competing and feeling absolutely loved by you. You are the God who sees us. You are the God who hears us. And you are the God who gives us more. We offer you all our praise. Thank you, Jesus, for visiting a, a pregnant slave girl in the desert. 
gives us great hope. Amen.